in the Gospel of Matthew, Matthew chapter 5, and we're going to begin reading in verse 38, Matthew's Gospel <clears throat> chapter 5 and verse 38, just a few short verses tonight, down to verse 42, and we're thinking tonight about turning the other cheek, turning the other cheek, and of course we are in the Sermon on the Mount here in Matthew chapter 5, as we will be in chapter 6, and indeed in chapter 7. But we want to look at this short tract of Scripture tonight, beginning in verse 38, where the Lord Jesus says, You have heard said, An eye for an eye, and a tooth for a tooth. But I say unto you, that ye resist not evil, but whosoever shall smite thee on thy right cheek, Turn to him the other also. And if any man will sue thee at the law and take away thy coat, let him have thy cloak also. And whosoever shall compel thee to go a mile, go with him twain. Give to him that asketh thee, and from him that would borrow of thee, turn not thou away. And we trust the Lord will bless his, the reading of his precious word this evening. Well, you can't have escaped the fact that in recent years our nation has become a nation obsessed with rights. Have you noticed that everybody now has rights that are peculiar just to them? So you have rights in the workplace, you've got rights in school, you even have rights in churches. There's civil rights and women's rights. There's workers' rights, prisoners' rights, LGBT rights, rights for the disabled, and animal rights. And woe betide anybody who dare step on my rights. Well, there's no new thing under the sun. And people in ancient times were just as concerned with their rights under the law as indeed we are today. And it's to this issue that the Lord Jesus now turns his attention and presses home the truth that to be a kingdom dweller, you have to do better than the Pharisees and your righteousness must exceed theirs. Well, he looks again at the law and he begins with a basic concept there in verse 38. You have heard that it hath been said and a tooth for a tooth. Now, this statement is found in three different places in the Old Testament law. It's found, uh, first of all, in the book of uh, Exodus, in chapter 21, in verses 23 to 25, where it says, Thou shalt give life for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot, burning for burning, wound for wound, stripe for stripe. And that particular passage is relating to a serious injury upon a pregnant mother that may or may not lead to the loss of her life or the loss of the life of her baby. And if either life was lost, well then the perpetrator, the person who uh, committed the injury, is to pay accordingly. Or if there is just some physical injury, uh, again they have to pay accordingly. Then the second instance of this law uh, being given in the Old Testament is in Leviticus chapter 24 and verse 20, where it says, Breach for breach, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, as he hath caused a blemish in a man, so shall it be done to him again. And this is now speaking about personal injury. Now, the law is not requiring like for like here, uh, nor is it suggesting that the perpetrator should be maimed in some way. That is not what the Bible is teaching. But it's saying that he should pay a fair amount of compensation proportionate to the victim's loss. That's the idea. And then in Deuteronomy chapter 19, the very last book of the law, we find in verse 21, the, the verse says, life shall go for life. Eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot 
for food. And this particular aspect of the law was addressing the situation where two witnesses come into a court and they perjure themselves. They lie against the defendant in the hope that they will get some compensation from the defendant. And the law was that when they were discovered or if they were discovered perjuring themselves, lying in court in that way, well, they were to pay the defendant exactly what it was that they were trying to extort from him by means of legal recourse. Now, there's nothing wrong with any of this. This is how the law really should operate, don't you think? That when people uh, are victimized in some way, that the person who has created their victimhood, who has made them a victim, should have to pay, and the payment should be proportionate to the injury that is caused. In other words, we say the punishment should fit the crime. The punishment should fit the crime, but unfortunately in our country very often now the punishment does not seem to fit the crime. And so we feel very often that our courts are more than lenient with people. Even this week we've had a rather ludicrous, I think it's a ludicrous situation, where if a person lies about where they've come from uh, as far as entering the country, they can face imprisonment up to 10 years for telling a lie. But if somebody is the subject of a sexual attack, uh, well, the person who attacks them would get less than 10 years. And you see that there's an imbalance there in the law, that there's, there's not like for like. It's not, a, it's not an appropriate sentence. And even right now in our courts, there are two cases being appealed. Uh, the one, it concerns a police officer who was murdered uh, by a man who was driving a getaway car. He dragged that police officer behind him knowingly, uh, realizing that the police officer was uh, stuck in the car and that he was likely to cause him injury. He deliberately drove the car in such a way as to kill the police officer. Uh, he got uh, 16 years for that and uh, he will be out in eight years with good behavior for killing a police officer. And so the, the widow of the police officer and uh, their legal counsel is seeking recourse and asking for a longer sentence to be given to the wrongdoer. In the other case, a police officer was sentenced to 10, and a half, 10 years, and he'll be out in five years uh, for, with good behavior for murdering a married woman with whom he was committing adultery. And he thinks that, the, that in his case, the sentence was too harsh. He thinks that 10 years is too for murdering someone. And I think, if, I think all of us would pretty much agree that that is way too lenient and the sentence is very much too short. So under the Old Testament economy, both of these killers would themselves have been killed. They would have been put to death uh, for taking a life. So there would have been a proportionate response to their wrongdoing. There would have been a life for a life. So that's where we're at today. That's where they were in Jesus' day. So what was Jesus' problem with the law? Well, of course, it wasn't that he disagreed with the law. I mean, after all, he was the one who gave the law in the first place. He's the author of the law. But what had happened over the course of time is that the law became a law of retaliation, as it was known, and it was taken out of the courts and it was placed into the hands of individuals so that you could exact your own payment for any injury that was caused you. And so the Pharisees had said, if, you, if somebody did something wrong to you, you could do them wrong in return. You could do the same thing. So if, if uh, they chopped off your hand, you could chop off their hand. And on it went. Well, you can imagine how this works out. This is a complete breakdown in society, really. Uh, because you know, if everybody was allowed just to exact their own sentence for the things that we think are wrong, well, you can imagine what kind of anarchic state we would be living in. And, uh, you know, people being people, well, they'll often go much further in their revenge than is really just. So this Old Testament law of, a, of an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth was really intended to uh, not encourage retaliation, but to regulate retribution. 
In other words, it was intended to make sure that whatever punishment was, was uh, given, that it was proportionate to the crime that was committed, and so that no injustice could be done. And so it prevented people. This law was given not to allow people to express their anger, but it was given to prevent people from overstepping the boundaries of justice in avenging themselves against someone who had wronged them. But now that private individuals were carrying out their own retaliation, well, you can imagine there were probably quite a few cases in which people went above and beyond that which was really called for in a response to a wrong. So Jesus broadens the concept in verses 39 to 42, and he dealt with two, uh, two issues. This issue he dealt with on two fronts. He spoke about when we are wronged in verse 39, and then he speaks about when we are in the wrong in verses 40 to 42. Now, if you look at verse 39 and think about when we are wronged, and he says this, I say unto you that you resist not evil, but whosoever shall smite thee on thy right cheek, turn to him the other also. Now, I understand the Lord is not dealing here with physical assault. Okay, He is not saying that if you are being abused in some way, if you've got an abusive husband or an abusive partner, that they are physically abusing you or sexually abusing you or even mentally abusing you, that you just have to accept that. You just have to take it and turn the other cheek and, and live with the abuse. Uh, you know, I don't believe for one moment that the Lord Jesus was teaching that. Uh, I very, very rarely uh, encourage women to leave their husbands. But if a woman is being beaten by her husband, if he's being physically or sexually abusive of her, then I think she's in her rights to leave the family home and to protect herself from injury uh, from an abusive husband. So the Lord Jesus wasn't teaching that a woman or any individual who was being abused had to stay with their abuser and had to just put up with the wrong. But rather he's dealing in, in cultural terms with a matter of insult. You see, in the culture of this day, a man might slap another man with the back of his hand as an insult. So if you, you want to insult somebody, uh, you would just take your hand and slap it across their face. And that was the insult. I'm sure it wasn't very pleasant. Uh, and I'm sure that uh, if uh, it was happening in our day, if people weren't going to lawyers, first of all, they'd probably be punching one another uh, at the end of such an insult. But nevertheless, that's what was happening. And it was a way in which dem uh, you demeaned the other person. You humiliated them. You slapped them. And uh, even to this day, if someone says something or does something that results in a loss of respect or dignity for the other person, we say, well, that was a slap in the face, don't we? And that's where it comes from. It comes from this culture where people were literally slapped in the face as a means of insult. Now, you and I, living in this Western culture, live within a culture of blame. That's why if we feel like our rights have been trod upon, then someone has to pay. And so we seek out a lawyer and we say, look, uh, my rights have been, uh, have been abused here and I want you to pursue this thing in court and get me some compensation. But in the Near East, they don't have a culture of blame. They have a culture of shame. Now, there's a very subtle difference between the two. You see, to be put to shame in the Middle East is really something to be avoided at all costs. Nobody wants shame. It's just an embarrassment more than they can bear. I remember being in Israel um, several years ago before we took our own church trip. I went on another trip, and on that trip we visited a town of Beth Shan with our church group. But we visited um, Beth Shan, uh, which is a very ancient uh, town in Israel. And uh, while we were there, our bus driver, who was an Arab, uh, decided that he would reverse the bus in the car park in order to be tour party came out. We got back on the bus and went to our next destination. And so when he was in the process of reversing the bus, he reversed it into a tree branch. This great big branch of a tree came crashing through the back window of the bus, smashed the glass, damaged the bus. And uh, under Israeli law now, he was required to get a new bus. In other words, his insurance wouldn't have covered him or there was some legality involved here whereby he had to get a new bus 
before he could board his passengers and we could proceed to the next destination. Well, you folks who went to Israel know how tight the schedule is. You're, you're running from pillar to post, really. Uh, and so, you know, our tour guide got back and she was livid. She was absolutely livid. Now, she was, uh, she was a, Jew, a Jewish woman and he was an Arab man. So be, there was already a little bit of tension there as it was. And so when she came back, uh, she asked him what had happened. And uh, he said that what had happened was that an evil spirit came along and persuaded him that he should reverse his bus and it was okay, everything was safe, but the spirit lied to him and as a consequence the window was damaged. Well, she went ballistic and she let him have it. And uh, they were going back and forth, and I'm not sure whether it was Arabic or Hebrew, I can't remember now, but they were going back and forth in one or other of the languages, and she was letting him have it. And then she turned around and she says to us, you people, you live in a culture of blame, but him, he is from a culture of shame. And she shamed him for damaging the bus and lying in this way. Well, you know, that's very foreign to us, and we may not get that, but that is the culture in which Jesus was ministering. So in the minds of Jesus' listeners, to take the blame is to bear the shame. So the idea is at all costs, you do not take the blame for anything. Because if you take the blame for something, you're going to be humiliated. You're going to be made to feel low. You're going to be the one who's got egg in your face. You're going to be embarrassed. And you're going to be the one who's shamed. So uh, Jesus says, now in verse 39 to his listeners, he says, do take the blame. If you do something wrong, someone sues you at the law, and you're in the wrong, do take the blame. Do bear the shame because you are at fault. He says, don't try to defend yourself when you have done wrong. Admit your guilt and make it right. He says, he says you've got to do the right thing. And he gives three examples of this in uh, verses uh, 39 onwards. He says, or verse 40 onwards, he, said, he talks about suing someone at law for your coat. Now, he says, if any man will sue thee at the law and take away thy coat, let him have thy cloak also. So this is where you're in the wrong. Now, understand when he talks about a coat, when we think about a coat, we think of an overgarment. But when the Bible here speaks about a coat, it's talking about an inner garment. And the cloak is the outer garment. And the cloak doubles up as a blanket at night. So, you know, if you were sleeping under the stars or it was a chilly evening, that cloak would be your blanket, your cover for the evening. And by law, a man was not allowed to actually keep your cloak. Under the law, he wasn't allowed to keep your cloak. You could give him your cloak as a pledge of your intention to right or wrong, but he was not legally, uh, or he was not legally entitled to keep your cloak. He had to return it to you each evening. Well, you can imagine what a pain that is. You know, if somebody gives you a pledge that they're going to pay your debt, uh, and then you've got to keep finding that person to give them back the pledge for the evening, well, obviously then most people didn't try to take a cloak because it was more trouble than it was worth. And the, and the Bible says that the reason for this is that he, the perpetrator, may sleep in his own raiment and bless thee, and it shall be righteousness unto thee before the Lord thy God. In other words, for showing this mercy to the one who did wrong, the Lord will bless you. But Jesus said, if you're going to make it into the kingdom, not only do you have to acknowledge your wrong, but you have to forfeit the right to keep your cloak. You need to surrender it up to your legal adversary. So what he said, can you imagine us going into a court? This would be like in our country. You go into the court and the court says, we're going to fine you 250 pounds. And you put your hand up and you say to the judge, I'd like to pay 500 pounds. <laughs> you know, I would well imagine a judge would be kind of taken aback. If you said, well, you know, I was in the wrong. You know, you're right. I should be fined. Let me pay double what you what you fined me. Uh, I don't think I've ever heard of a court case where such a thing ever happened. So the Lord then brings us to a second law, which is the law of conscription, in which if someone requires you by law to go a mile, you should go two miles with that person. Now, this has to do with Roman law. 
Under Roman law, a Roman soldier could legally commandeer you, force you, compel you as a citizen, as a civilian, if requested, to carry his luggage or any other equipment that he may be carrying. Uh, uh, and and uh, under the law, under Roman law, that could only be done for one Roman man. In other words, he couldn't force you to march with him all the way to where he was going. So he would stop along the way and he'd say to you, listen, carry my bags. And you would have to take his bags and you'd have to walk one mile up the road by law. Well, you can imagine how this goes down. I mean, they're an army of occupation. Can you imagine this? Can you imagine if the Germans have, had invaded Britain and actually succeeded in the invasion of Britain and some Nazi was standing at the, you know, you were standing at the side of the road and some Nazi soldier went past and he said, you listen, I want you to carry this uh, item for me. You carry my backpack for me. Well, you know what your instinct would be? I don't think so. Carry your own backpack. You'd be, you'd be resentful, wouldn't you? You'd be agitated. And the Jewish people were no different. They were very angry. When any proud Jew was asked to carry the luggage any kind of distance, he was angry. In fact, you get an example of this in the Gospel of Mark. If you were following along in our Bible readings together this week, you will come across Simon of Cyrene. And you remember that when the Lord was on his way to the cross, he was compelled to carry the cross. The Bible says they compel one Simon, a Cyrenian, who passing by, coming out of the country, the father of Alexander and Rufus, to bear the cross. Well, that's what's going on there. Jesus is beginning to stumble. He's, you know, he's physically weak from loss of blood. And uh, the soldier realizes, well, we're not going to get to Calvary at this rate. And he sees this fellow, Simon of Cyrene, who probably looked like a fairly muscular and healthy fellow. And he says, hey, you, you carry the cross. You carry the crossbar here. Bear it upon your shoulder and we'll give him some rest till we get him up to the point where we're going to kill him. And so he had to do just that. Well, you can imagine Simon, he hadn't come to carry crosses. He'd come for the Passover. He'd come to worship. He was, you know, probably at first rather agitated by this Roman soldier. Who does he think he is? You know, I'm from Libya. I'm not even from here. I'm just a tourist. <laughs> you know, uh, I didn't come to carry crosses. Uh, I'm here with my lamb and I'm heading up to the temple for the Passover. And so he was probably a little bit annoyed at being asked to do this, as any Jewish person would have been. And certainly a native Jew would have been very, very annoyed at being asked this. So they would have done it under duress. Now, if you had to do it, if you were asked by a foreign soldier from an army of occupation to walk one mile carrying his backpack, how far would you walk? One mile. You would do one mile because the law required you to do one mile. But that would be it. It would be one mile and not one inch more than one mile. But Jesus says, if this happens to you, if a Roman soldier looks at you and he says, I want you to carry my luggage for the next mile, he says, look at him with a, a smile and say, because I'm the child of the kingdom, I'll carry it another mile. Now, how do you think his hearers responded to that kind of radical teaching? They probably thought, this guy's a nutcase. There is no way. It's bad enough to have to walk one mile, but now to have to carry this stuff for two miles just to prove that I'm a child of the king. Well, I don't think that's on. You see, they were being asked to respond to unjustified demands by giving even more than was being asked of them. That is a radical response. And then in verse 42, we read that they were to give to anyone anything that was asked of them. Give to him that asketh thee and from him that would borrow or take of thee, turn not thou away. Now, from our earliest days, this is counterintuitive. Do you remember when you were a child, or you've probably seen your own children, and their inability to share? You notice that children, when they're very young, have an inability to share? We used to say to our kids, you know, Jesus wants you to share. And our kids would say, but not this. <laughs> you, know, you know, Jesus wants you to share your chocolate. No, he doesn't, Dad. He wants me to share other things, but not my chocolate. And they would often argue with us because they didn't want to share. 
And uh, we've all seen that. We've all been there. We've all watched the children in the nursery tugging at a toy, fighting over it because one doesn't want to play and share with the other. We don't want to share. And we certainly don't want to be in this kind of situation. You know, a couple of years ago, you may remember, we had Brother Nigel Kissick here. And uh, Nigel was representing the gospel mission to South America. And in the course of his ministry that weekend, he said that he had come under conviction about this matter, for he used to walk past the homeless, and he used to walk past beggars as they held out their hand looking for money. But then the Lord reminded him of this verse, Give to him that asketh thee, and from him that would borrow of thee, turn not thou away. So he said that if somebody actually asked him for money, he would give them money. And, you know, when I heard that, uh, you know, I felt ashamed in my own spirit. I actually felt convicted. Uh, and I thought, well, you know, I have walked past tons of people who have asked me for money, and I've just not made eye contact with them. I've not, you know, wanted to be involved with them. Uh, I didn't want to give up my money to them. Uh, and so, you know, I would just scuttle by. And people do that all the time, don't we? But now, if someone asks, I give it. You say, well, pastor, that person's going to use it in drugs. It may well be they're going to use it on drugs. I don't know what they're going to use it for. You know, I, uh, I had a fellow in the Tesco car park in Hanley a while back who asked me for a pound. If he, you know, he asked me for one pound. I had a pound. I gave him a pound. If he, did, he shortchanged himself because he didn't realize that I was under conviction. If he'd asked me for 10 pounds, he could have had 10 pounds. But uh, he only asked me for a pound, so I gave him a pound. I gave him what he asked for. And uh, I did it, and I've got to, you know, I've got to uh, say that this is Nigel Kissick's fault. <laughs> because in previous time I would have said, no, sorry, man, I can't help you. And went on. But uh, now I gave the guy a pound. And you say, well, what's he going to do with that pound? You know what? That's not my problem. That's not my problem. What he does with the pound is immaterial. He may be genuinely homeless. He really can use that pound. Maybe to you know, buy some little item of food or whatever. He may well take it and waste it on drugs or alcohol. That's not my business. My business and your business is to do as the Lord commands. And the Lord says if someone asks you for something, then you're to give it to them. Uh, and uh, from him that would take of thee, that would borrow of thee, turn not away. Now notice the progression here in this sermon. He goes from the passive turning the other cheek to the active, actually giving to someone who you may not wish to give to. So you're not talking about giving a birthday present or a Christmas present here to somebody that you love, something that you freely give and are happy to part with. He's talking about giving to someone who just asks of you, just any old stranger who says, can you give me money? And if you have the money, the Lord says, give him the money. So there's the progression from the passive to the active. Now, we might be tempted to think that all of this is a revision of the Old Testament law, that these New Testament teachings uh, are somehow different from Old Testament teachings. But actually, these teachings that the Lord is presenting to us are rooted in the Old Testament law. You see, some people get this idea that the God of the Old Testament was an ogre, that he was mean and vengeful and hateful and angry and unapproachable, whereas the God of the New Testament is fluffy and light and kind and gentle and merciful and gracious, and they're two different gods. No, they're not. It's the same God. Old Testament and New Testament. And there's not two different revelations of God. Rather, there is one revelation of God that is revealed in the Bible. The Old Testament being written uh, for the Jewish people and the New Testament addressing largely the churches of Christ. So, if you were to take the time, we'll not take the time this evening, but if you were to take the time and look at Leviticus chapter 19, you'll come across this interesting little nugget in verse 17. It says, Thou shalt not hate thy brother in thine heart. Thou shalt in any ways rebuke thy neighbor. Thou shalt not in any ways rebuke thy neighbor and not suffer sin upon him. Thou shalt not avenge nor bear any grudge against the children of thy people, but thou shalt love thy neighbor... As thyself. I am the Lord. You see that? You know, when the Lord says, uh, you know, that you shall love your neighbor as yourself, people think, well, that's a New Testament teaching. No, all he's doing is reiterating the law. 
That's an Old Testament teaching. Believers were always expected to love their neighbors as themselves. Now you put yourself in the shoes of those various people in those various situations. If you're the Roman soldier and you ask someone to carry your bag a mile, what do you want that person to do? Carry it a mile. In fact, you'll be even happier if they carry it two miles, won't you? Or indeed, if you ask somebody for something, if you're standing outside the Hanley uh, Tesco and you're freezing and you're cold and maybe you're addicted and maybe you're hungry or maybe you're thirsty and you ask a passerby, can you give me a pound? Well, if you were in that person's shoes, what would you want of the passerby? You'd want them to give you the pound. And so the Lord says you've got to love your neighbor as yourself. You've got to do unto others as you would have done unto you. And so we have to hold up our hands here. And all of us admit that we have fallen short of these standards, haven't we? I mean, I have. None of us have met the bill on this account. And yet with all, to get into the kingdom of heaven, if it's contingent upon these things, well, once again, we find ourselves on the wrong side of heaven's door. You know, if I have to get into heaven by virtue of the fact that I've given to everybody who's asked me, or I've uh, taken the insult that everybody has given me with good grace and turned the other cheek, or if indeed I have uh, been willing to go an extra mile uh, for those who have compelled me to do something, if my getting into heaven depends upon that kind of uh, attitude and response, I'm not getting into heaven. I'm not going to enter the kingdom. But Jesus... Jesus fulfilled the law, and he accomplished the seemingly impossible standards of the law. You think about it. You know, again, this week in our readings, we would have read about the scene in the Garden of Gethsemane, and something caught my attention there that I never really twigged on before. I'm, I know I've read it before, but sometimes you just read something and it kind of locks in there. And one of the things that I read in, the, in, the, uh, in one of the accounts of the Garden of Gethsemane was that an angel came into the garden and ministered to Jesus. Did you see that in your reading this week? An angel came in and ministered to him. In my mind, he's always alone in the garden. But then I see that actually an angel was in the garden. An angel came and ministered to him. Now, we know that in that garden, he had the authority, and we know from reading even the presence of the angels, he had the authority to call 12 legions of angels to come to, the rest, to his rescue in the garden. But instead, he allowed himself to be arrested, and he permitted himself to be crucified. You see that again. Again, when they actually come to arrest him in the garden, he speaks a word. They said, you know, he says, are you looking for Jesus of Nazareth? He's, I am. I am he. I am. And when he utters the words, I am, of course, they're forced backward and they're compelled to worship him before he then allows them to get back up and he allows himself to be taken uh, and then to be insulted uh, and struck on the face. Remember, he's struck on the face. He's insulted. They're slapping him. He allows that to happen. And all the while, he's remaining silent before his accusers. When the Roman soldiers finally do crucify him, what do they do? They gamble for the clothes on his back. What did Jesus say here? He says, well, if somebody takes you to law and they want your coat, give them your cloak also. What was the one thing that they weren't prepared to tear up into four pieces? Well, it was the cloak, wasn't it? It was that robe which they gambled over. So even on the cross, he gave them his coat, his inner garments, but he also gave them his cloak. And he himself was exposed and naked upon the cross. As the Jewish leaders mocked and ridiculed him when he hung upon the cross, he didn't try to stop them. He didn't re uh, re uh, respond with rebuke and reviling. Instead, he prayed that his father would forgive them. And then he hung on the cross in complete shame and disgrace, dying for you and for me. You see what he did? He practiced his own sermon. He practiced what he preached here. Now, I look at this sermon, and this is just, you know, five verses of it, and I think that. 
You know, if somebody, if I step out of here tonight and somebody slaps me in the face, chances are good I'm going to respond in the flesh. <laughs> and we're going to have a, a toe-to-toe in, in uh, Meadow Street. Now, hopefully that won't happen. <laughs> Or if someone, you know, sues me at law tomorrow, and if I'm in the wrong, well, I want to get away with the least that I can pay. I don't want to have to pay more than I have to pay under the law. But Jesus says, no, you, you need to go further than that. And so Peter describes it like this in 1 Peter chapter 2. He says, Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that we should follow his steps, who did no sin, neither found in his mouth, who, when he was reviled, reviled not again. When he suffered, he threatened not, but committed himself to him that judges righteously, who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree, that we, being dead to sins, should live unto righteousness, by whose stripes he are healed. The story is told of a truck driver who dropped into an all-night motorway restaurant. The waitress had just served him his hot meal when three arrogant leather-jacketed motorcyclists entered and rushed up to him and tried to pick a fight with him. One grabbed a hamburger off his plate. Another took a handful of his fries and the third picked up his drink and began to drink it from his cup. The trucker didn't respond as we might expect, but instead he calmly rose, picked up his bill, walked to the counter, put the bill and his money in cash on the cash register, and he went out the door. The waitress watched out the door as the truck drove away into the night. When she returned, one of the motorcyclists said to her, Well, he wasn't much of a man, was he? She replied, I don't know how much of a man he is, but he's not much of a truck driver. He just ran over three motorbikes. (laughs) Well, evidently, he wasn't much for turning the other cheek either. And the truth be told, we aren't. You see, what we like about that story is what? He got his own back. He got his own back. You know, they got a hamburger, but he got three motorcycles. And those three motorcycles cost more than his hamburger. And this is the very thing that the Lord is telling us about. You see, in our own human nature, we joy in the fact that the victim in this case got far more than was just considering the crime that was committed against him. When we are wronged, we want someone to pay. When we are in the wrong, We want to pay the very least that we can get away with. But Jesus said to get into the kingdom, you have to do better than that. And then he showed us how it was done before dying in our place. So this evening, you and I who are followers of the Lord Jesus, who are believers on him, who are Christians, I want to call upon you and I to follow him. But if you're not a Christian, then I want to call upon you to follow him. I'm not calling upon you to follow a church. I'm not calling upon you to follow a religion. Uh, Please don't always follow my example. I try to be a good example, but sometimes I fail even in that uh, simple task. Uh, Yet I'm asking you to follow after Jesus, to admit your shortcomings, to come with your failures, to come with your hurts and invite him to be your savior. Ask him to forgive your sin and to change your life. Ask him to reconcile you unto God. Ask him to cover your sin so that you're not trying to live to such exacting standards that you could not possibly meet them no matter how hard you try your whole life long. This is the beauty of the gospel. The beauty of the gospel is that the Lord says, you've got to stop trying so hard and just start trusting. Trusting in what I've done. Trusting in the life that Jesus lived. Trusting in the death that Jesus died. Believing on the resurrection that Jesus experienced. And so if you're not a Christian tonight, I want to encourage you to do just that. But if you are a Christian, 
My, isn't there an example for us to follow here? Peter says that Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example. He's expecting us now to live it out. He's expecting you and I to take these truths and employ them as part of our lives. We're called upon to follow him. Now, admittedly, we will fail. But this, friends, is the way that we ought to go if we're really going to manifest the fact that we are truly children of his kingdom. Shall we pray? <coughs> Father, we thank you tonight for your love. We thank you for the Lord Jesus and for his example. We thank you, God, that he wasn't one who preached one thing and then did something else. We thank you, Father, that he was one who lived out what he preached and that he is one who even now reaches out to us in our feelings and in our sin and is desirous to save us if that is our spiritual need tonight. Father, if there is someone watching or listening, I pray, Father, that you would speak to their hearts if they're not saved tonight, if they do not know Christ as their own, that this very night they would admit that their own instincts run contrary to that which Jesus presented as kingdom standard in the Sermon on the Mount. Help them to see, Lord, that all of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And there's only been one who ever lived a life of perfection, who completely accomplished the law, who fulfilled its every letter, who walked a perfect life before thee. And then he laid down that life for us. In sin, he took our place and took our punishment and died in our place so that we might go free. Help anyone listening tonight who's in a position where they realize they need to get right with God to do just that by calling upon the name of the Lord Jesus and asking for his forgiveness and his free gift of salvation tonight, believing that he alone is the Savior of men. Father, for you and for your people, uh, for we who are gathered here and others who are listening at home, help us to indeed seek to live out this example. Lord, help us to uh, go the extra mile when we're called upon. Help us to give when people ask us for something. Help us to be a people of generosity and good grace. Lord, when we've done wrong, help us to say that we are sorry. Help us to bear the blame and the shame and to make every effort to make that thing right. Lord, we just ask tonight that you'd help us to live out Christ in these dark days, that people might see Jesus in us and that for your glory, for we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's listen tonight to our final hymn.